action. We face those icy fucks. <laughs> Look to right into their blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> The feast was a, was a wonderful sequence of 17 pages long, in one room, and many different things going on. That was really fun, that the, the feast scene being one of the first scenes we shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we had a room full of cast, and it was like coming back to school on the first few days when everyone's just so hyper to be back. We're like having fun, cracking jokes, like having a really good time. And yeah, it was good fun. You didn't know. Denmark was a country until you met Nikolai. Oh. For characters like me, it's great, you know? Get to relax for a little bit, you know? Have a drink, hang out with my pals. And obviously after what happened in season three, Rumor has obviously got around that he's uh, talented, so. Yeah, there's, there's that. It's, it's holiday time for Pod. Of course, it's horrible that so many people has died, but still, the show must go on. Life must go on. You have to celebrate it somehow. So the only way is to get very drunk and to have a lot of fun. <laughs> to Arya Stark, the hero of Winterfell. <laughs> that feast scene in episode four is... That was a bitch. That was a bitch to plot out. It was a real bitch to shoot. And it's because so much of the scene, like a lot of, I think, the best scenes on Game of Thrones are about what's not being said. If you turn off the sound on that scene, the hope would be that you're really following all of the emotional arcs through the looks that all of the characters are giving to each other. And that's very difficult to pull off, and it takes a director of precision like David Nutter. It takes actors of extraordinary intelligence and empathy and patience. And it takes writers like David and Dan who can really structure it. That was a fun sequence. We had to catch all these you looking at him, looking at you, but you're not seeing me look at him, looking at you. And a lot of glances, and that happens at parties. I had to do this in a way that everything's connected, but also everything's not connected. So it's all about a question where you put people, and I set it up. So the plan which David came up with was you put them into groups and isolate them to a degree, which we can do with camera angles, so that once a certain group has shot out its piece, we have them traveling up the hall, which connects to the next group. So just clever choreography. As far as the lighting, it's always uh, tough because you want you have all those people eating. You want to shot multiple camera because there's uh, multiple people talking, and so you want to create something that is flexible. So my trick was candles. What we did, we built some boxes under the candle, like some little riser, and inside I had little lights. So the light was coming from the glow inside the table and not just a general top light. Most of our drama scenes were action scenes, simply in terms of the number of bodies that we had on the ground. When you have that many moving parts, it's always going on, and you're always painting a picture behind the actors who are giving the dialogue or walking through the frame. If I was to try to find you and Dan somewhere in the episodes, would I be able to? Uh, I think maybe. A madman! <laughs> or a king! <laughs> Okay, please take the juice. Leave it in there, leave it in, it's good. You're there. Well hidden. Well hidden? Yeah, giant beard. Uh, I was concerned we were gonna ruin that, but I, I don't think we did. <laughs> yeah, let's give some notes to the director. We're there at Wildling University. <laughs> I'd smile, but I'd be like, you're not power. <laughs> <laughs>
the heroes lying down. We did a process of tough and glass and bulletproof plastic underneath. And then uh, the hero would go in and put a torch underneath the actor, uh, and then you'd see beneath them, you'd see the flames spread. There would be flame reacting around the sides of them, but not actually touching them. But because you're seeing the flame through glass, to all intents and purposes, you're seeing flame, which is really extraordinary. Once we'd finished with the real people in the funeral pyres, they were sw switched out by the props department for burning bodies, chicken wire bodies that were costumed, because we were actually setting fire to the funeral pyres for real. It was a huge burn in terms of fire. So we had fire support, medical support, and that was the classic biggest, widest shot of Winterfell with the hugest effect in the front of it. What I remember is that it was incredibly hard to put out, which I did say it would be very difficult to put out. <laughs> it gets very hot, everyone has to move back because they feel the flames. I knew the shot was over when I saw Bran running past me. <laughs> I was like, well, that's got to be over if Bran started to walk again. Episode three is such a massive battle, and so many people fall during that episode. And part of that is about our heroes, you know, the characters that we really know. And part of it is just seeing the sheer number of, of other folks who fell. We've got real pyres that were built by our department and then the VFX team extended them so you can see that there's actually thousands and thousands of fallen. So what was important with respect to the funeral in episode four was the fact that I wanted to make sure that there's some big scopey stuff that was important, but also there was some really intimate moments between the characters that I didn't want to lose. There was a moment in which Danny says goodbye to, to Jorah, where Sansa says goodbye, to, says goodbye to Theon. So I wanted to make sure that, that that was really covered in the proper fashion. That was really hard. Uh, I remember right before my take, putting the pin on Alfie, David Nutter came up, the director, and he was like, you never got to say goodbye, and you never told him that he, you saw him as a Stark. And then I was, like, bawling, because I'm thinking, like, I will never properly get to say goodbye to Alfie as Theon. Like, that would be so crazy. It was something in which we all have situations in our life where people that die at the wrong time and things happen before you expect it to happen, where you say to yourself, I wish I had said this, I wish I had done that. So I, I wanted to make sure that there was something gnawing at her. She took that nugget, made it into something special. She's that great of an actress. She really did a tremendous job there with that. The emotion was easy to capture because the emotion was, was very real. Um, these are people who've been working together, and some of them for, for 10 years. Yeah, it was, it was a very difficult thing to to say goodbye. Even if uh, the ceremony was fictional, the, the goodbye and the emotions in the goodbye were very real. The new Scorpion this year is phenomenal. I think with Dave and Dan, they just want to scale everything up. Everything had to be better and bolder for this year. I was hoping to use the same one again, thinking, well, it's, it was great last year. I mean, what, what could we possibly, what more could you want? We saw in season seven that Kyburn had invented this scorpion, this giant dragon-killing scorpion, and it didn't quite work. So Kyburn went back to the drawing board and he made even larger, more powerful scorpions. What we need to create this one is make it bigger, stronger, a bit more dynamic. It's 65% uh, bigger than we did previously on season seven. Euron has, has added a few little touches for himself. The seat on the back and added four more cross limbs for a bit more power and a bit more madness. The boat is a nice design, a bit of a more barbaric style. When you see it first, it'll be in its closed mode. And when you see it the second time, once it fires the projectile, it leaves the limb, it opens up, and it'll rotate. So it will rip open anything that it hits. 
It's absolutely incredible work. The whole production this season is just amazing, what they've been creating for us actors. You really feel that you're part of the biggest show in the world when you're sitting on a Scorpio and everything is just going around. You really feel wonderful. We have Joran sitting on the seat. He's in the back. He's like king of the castle, being swung around by four brutes. So these guys are lifting him up and down, doing this trajectory left and right. I mean, he loved it. He loved it. He'd have been still on it if he could. <laughs> I'm going to be brutally honest. I've talked to my wife about it, because you have to talk to someone, right? And I've mentioned to my wife, how awesome is it that I kill a dragon? And I kill it with a scorpion. Episode four has this little thing called Rhaegal's death. <laughs> And his demise is some of the gnarliest looking animation I've ever seen. Weta did an amazing job putting that together. In the end, we have a couple of shots of the destruction of Danny's ships. So again, we kind of are in a completely digital scenario to show how these boats up close puncture into the ship and tear it apart. And the last shot is a, is a very special one. It's one of Tyrion having this long shot running across the deck. That was another one, but kind of a cheated one. So we had him running around the deck. We had some physical effects there, but a lot of it we did later. One, go! Love it. Love it. Um, and when they're done in one shot, like this is one continuous thing, it doesn't let the viewer off the hook. All the boat work for Game of Thrones essentially is done on a, a set piece that's out in this location, Banbridge. Everything that you've ever seen on a boat in Game of Thrones, where people are standing, walking, or talking on a boat, has been done on that ship. It's surrounded by green screen, and everything around the boat will have to be replaced with CG water or water photography. And then at one point, the railing gets blown away, which the section that gets blown away is actually CG. So when all the pieces come together, you see the special effects, you see the CG, a lot of atmospherics. You see Peter going into the water. It's a, it's a pretty spiffy moment. King's Landing, City Wall and Gates. We sort of saw this as a sort of fortification around the whole of King's Landing. Then loosely based around the walls of Dubrovnik, which have a particular sort of style to stonework, which we were trying to hint at. By the time the platforms are on, we're looking not far off about 57 feet, 56, 57 feet to the top of the platforms. The towers are 49 feet high, the wall's about 200 foot long. The King's Landing Parley, the challenge is the size of the set. So we quickly decided and convinced everybody that most of the close-up work would be done on a separate set piece that would be built on the ground, right on the ground, and would put them probably at about eight feet up. So you'd be able to talk to the actor, bring the camera in a proper, you know, reasonable level to be able to achieve all the shots we had. Down. But it's a little bit of a, you know, Hollywood magic. Another challenge was that, of course, this set is incredibly visible from the surrounding area. I mean, and the big concern, of course, for this season, more than ever, was the secrecy of the plot. In other words, um, we wouldn't want to give away that Monday is going to be executed. So having her stand up there, you know, 40 feet high, there was no way to hide that. So again, later on, we are adding her in there now, uh, oftentimes as a digi-double, but for the close-up work, we shot her separately on stage to composite her on that per location. So we could put it together in the end as a seamless, oh, it's all been shot in the same place. When I read that, I, it made sense to me immediately. I was like, of course, why is she ever going to do something when someone tells her to do it? She's not going to go, OK. She's going to think, fuck you. 
Also, it's, you know, Danny's best friend, so she's like, fuck you, too. She's fun at parties, that's all I can say. <laughs> Parley is a Hail Mary pass from Tyrion. He's hoping that maybe if he brings up Cersei's child, he can talk some kind of sense into Cersei. Tyrion talks to his sister in a way that you think that she may actually listen to him for a change. She may listen to her heart and listen to what he has to say and, and understand it. You've always loved your children. More than yourself. So, wanted to be just to hang out with her just long enough to have, have it so that you would think that she may change. But she's got this look on her face where it's just like, that's just who I am. I can't help it. And, she, and Lena's a tremendous actress, she, and that played out beautifully. Bravo, Marka. There's such a kind of basic kid in her still. So I think she sees him in the moment asking her to do something for him. I beg you, if not for yourself, and for your child. And she can't do what he said. She can't, it's like a kid and a fight. She can't do what he tells her to do because that would be surrendering. If you have any last words, now is the time. To play that despair, but that also that fight and finding that duality in that moment, it was quite challenging, but David Nutter, who's, you know, wonderful, was really great and supportive and was really good at helping support me in that scene. It's sad, it's a sad moment for her because she's, to have liberation and then have it just taken from me, it's heartbreaking. Dracarys! Grey Worm losing her is just like, there's nothing left. There's just nothing, he has nothing left now. She has taught him how to be a human being, like her and Danny have nurtured him into being human. And then it's just taken away. In the final shot of Danny walking away, we knew it would be the last shot. It wasn't any, any question of how we were gonna go out of the episode, so it was really a question of how Amelia would convey kind of almost unimaginable sense of, of anger and rage and, and vengeance while walking towards the camera and past the camera without saying a word, but uh, I would say she did it.